Good evening and welcome to the 2020 Mental Health Association of Michigan's Virtual Tribute Celebration Pre-Show. Wow, that was a lot. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in early. My name is RJ Cash and I will be your host this evening. We're so excited about this event and we're thrilled that you're taking time out of your busy lives to join us. We promise that you'll be entertained too, just not by anything I do. <laughs> We've got music performances by Michigan musician and singer-songwriter Taylor Taylor. This short video clip, Clifford Beers in his own words, an interview with a family who has lived experience with mental health. And best of all, we'll be honoring two people that have made monumental contributions in the mental health arena, Michigan State Representative Mary Whiteford and CEO of Integrated Services of Kalamazoo, Jeff Patton. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the pre-show before we get into tonight's festivities. If you feel led, you're always welcome to donate to MHAM's work with the link below. That's www.mha-mi.com slash members hyphen sponsors. We would like to thank our sponsors for tonight, Synovian and Takeda Pharmaceuticals and Hope Network. We appreciate your support of our event and mission. If you're not familiar with MHAM's mission statement, well, here it is. The association's mission is to improve care and treatment of mental illness, promote positive mental health, and prevent the onset of mental disorders. We do this through policy analysis and advocacy with government, primarily at the state government level in Lansing. MHAM has been around since 1936, which by my calculations is over 500 years old. Throughout our program tonight, you're welcome to post in the chat function of our online platform. We would love to hear where you're from and why you decided to join us tonight. If you found us by the MHAM Facebook event, please check into the event to let others know you're participating. If you're using any other socials tonight, we encourage you to use the hashtag AmIMentalHealth and hashtag MentalHealthMatters. Let's start with a little trivia, shall we? Have you ever wondered about the story of the Mental Health America Bell? The Mental Health Bell is actually a symbol of hope. During the early days of mental health treatment, asylums often restrained people who had mental illnesses with iron chains and shackles around their ankles and wrists. With better understanding and treatments, this cruel practice eventually stopped. In the early 1950s, Mental Health America issued a call to asylums across the country for their discarded chains and shackles. On April 13, 1953, at the McShane Bell Foundry in Baltimore, Maryland, Mental Health America melted down these inhumane bindings and recast them into a sign of hope, the Mental Health Bell. The inscription on the Mental Health Bell reads, Cast from shackles which bound them, this bell shall ring out hope for the mentally ill and victory over mental illness. Bonus round! In 1953, who poured the metal made from the chains that used to restrain people with a mental illness diagnosis? Anything? The answer, Maryland Governor Theodore McKeldin and Mrs. A. Felix DuPont. Now, the symbol of Mental Health America, the 300-pound bell serves as a powerful reminder that the invisible chains of misunderstanding and discrimination continue to bind people with mental illnesses. Today, the Mental Health Bell rings out hope for improving mental health and achieving victory over mental illnesses. Over the years, national mental health leaders and other prominent individuals have rung the bell to mark the continued progress in the fight for victory over mental illnesses. For a century now, Mental Health America has had the support and recognition of many United States presidents. The organization began with one man's dream to stop the inhumane treatment of people with mental health conditions and to change the way our nation views those with mental illness. Dear Governor Roberts, my name is Clifford W. Beers. As I write this letter, I am currently a resident at the institution that you know as the Connecticut State Hospital. 
Few, if any, prisons in this country provide worse conditions than in these institutions. I know, because I have purposely found my way into such areas of several mental institutions with a firm resolve to inspect and experience personally every type of ward, good and bad. I do this because... Clifford Beer has talked about changing the system. He, he promised he was going to do that. And he has done that literally generation after generation because in the first iteration, it was to reform the insides of state hospitals. The second iteration was to develop child guidance centers. The third iteration was to develop community programs and then so on through varieties of iterations, all of which have said basically one thing, recovery is an option, getting a life is an option. Therefore, I have devoted the next few years of my life to correcting abuses now in existence in every mental health institution in this country. Clifford Beers started a movement that continued after his death, a movement to change the face of mental health care. In 1953, Mental Health America issued a call for the inhumane shackles and restraints that were once used to bind patients with mental health conditions. From across the country, those hideous devices arrived and were melted and forged into a bell that would forever ring out hope and victory over mental illness. How's that for a mental health history lesson? We hope you learned a few things you may not have known before. At MHAM, we know that mental health matters every day. You know what? My voice is annoying. Even I'm getting tired of it. Let's switch up the vibe with some musical entertainment with Michigan-based musician and singer-songwriter Taylor Taylor. Taylor is 23 years old from Lansing, Michigan, and moved to Los Angeles, California to continue to grow her musical talents and career. She is a huge mental health advocate and voice for young adults. Her family has firsthand experience with mental health conditions and knows how it can affect families. She has joined us tonight to support MHAM's event. She'll be singing a cover, Put Your Records On, by Corinne Bailey Ray. Fun fact, Taylor won her very first talent show performing this song when she was 14 years old and used the contest winnings to buy her first nylon string guitar, which she still uses to this day. Take it away, Taylor. Good evening, everyone. My name is Taylor Taylor. I'm a singer and songwriter from Lansing, Michigan, and moved to LA a little over two years ago. Thank you so much for having me at your tribute celebration. I'd like to take a moment to thank some of our sponsors, Hope Network, Takeda Pharmaceuticals, and Synovian Pharmaceuticals. Three little birds sat on my window, and they told me I don't need to worry. Well, summer came like cinnamon, so sweet. Little girls double dutch on the concrete. Maybe sometimes we've got it wrong, but it's all right. The more things seem to change, the more they stay the same. Oh, don't you? Hesitate, girl, put your records on. Tell me your favorite song. You go ahead, let your hair down. Sapphire and faded jeans. I hope you get your dreams. Just go ahead, let your hair down. You're gonna find yourself somewhere, somehow. Blue as the sky, sunburnt and lonely Sipping tea at the bar by the roadside Just relax, just relax Don't you let those other boys fool you You gotta love that afro hairdo Maybe sometimes we feel afraid, but it's all right. 
night, the more things seem to change, the more they stay the same. Oh, don't you think it's strange? Girl, put your records on and tell me your favorite song. You go ahead, let your head down. Sapphire and faded jeans. I hope you get your dreams. Just go ahead, let your head down. You're gonna find yourself somewhere, somehow. Mm -hmm. You're gonna find yourself somewhere somehow welcome back and thank you taylor taylor is going to perform for us again at the end of our event an original song you won't want to miss you can find more about taylor at www.taylortaylormusic.com we hope you've enjoyed the pre-show so far. And again, if you feel led, you can always donate at www.mha-mi.com slash members hyphen sponsors. Up next, we'd like to give you a snippet of a day in the life of Clifford Beers, who's the founder of the mental hygiene movement that began in the early 1900s with Beers' book. The term mental hygiene had been suggested to Beers by Adolf Meyer and enjoyed a quick popularity thanks to the creation in 1909 of the National Commission of Mental Hygiene. The mental hygiene movement in its origins and reflecting Beers' experience in mental hospitals was primarily and basically concerned with the improvement of the care of people with mental disorders. In Beers' own words, when the National Committee was organized in 1909, its chief concern was to humanize the care of the insane, to eradicate the abuses, brutalities, and neglect from which the mentally sick have traditionally suffered. So what does the mental hygiene movement have to do with mental health treatment today? Well, a few things. For one, the movement was focused on improving care and treatment of individuals with mental health conditions. Two, the efforts to improve mental hygiene created a community movement. Beer's book brought to the attention of the nation the deplorable conditions that persons with mental illnesses experienced in state psychiatric hospitals, asylums, or sanatoriums. For those of you who are familiar with the community mental health system in Michigan, do you know why we have a community mental health system? Answer, the movement toward treatment of severe psychiatric conditions in the community began when President John F. Kennedy signed the Community Mental Health and Mental Retardation Centers Act into law on October 31st, 1963. Here's an excerpt of what President Kennedy said about the new approach. I am proposing a new approach to mental illness and a mental retardation. This approach is designed in large measure to use federal resources to stimulate state, local, and private action. When carried out, reliance on the cold mercy of custodial isolation will be supplanted by the open warmth of community concern and capability. Emphasis on prevention, treatment, and rehabilitation will be substituted for a desultory interest in confining patients in an institution to wither away. This law led to the establishment of comprehensive community mental health centers throughout the country. It helped people with mental illnesses who were warehoused in hospitals and institutions move back into their communities. With the invention of the first antipsychotic known as Thorazine by the French in 1952, it became possible to consider moving individuals who had been languishing in institutions back to their communities. The concept of community treatment, as opposed to placing individuals with mental health conditions in large psychiatric institutions, was developed partly as a consequence of the mental hygiene movement. Unfortunately, despite efforts to provide treatment to individuals with mental illness, conditions at state psychiatric hospitals did not improve for decades. Given that there were no medications to treat severe forms of mental illness until the 1950s, the ability to provide effective treatment was limited. Did you know that certain methods of providing psychiatric treatment were harmful to patients? Psychosurgery is perhaps the oldest known form of treatment for disorders of the brain. 
Ancient peoples used trephination of the human skull, which meant creating a hole in the head to let out the spirits, causing the distress. In the 20th century, the most well-known treatment was the prefrontal lobotomy, which became a preferred method of treatment by Dr. Walter Freeman. However, what many people do not know is that the lobotomy, which had been known as a leucotomy, was developed by a Portuguese neurologist, Agas Moniz, in the 1930s. Moniz won the Nobel Prize for the treatment in 1949. The good news is that mental health treatment has evolved over the past 110 years since Beers wrote his book. We'd like to give another shout out to our sponsors tonight, Sunovian Pharmaceuticals, Takeda Pharmaceuticals, and Hope Network. Thanks for joining us for our pre-show. Our main event will start momentarily. See you soon.
Welcome to the 2020 Mental Health Association in Michigan virtual tribute celebration. I am Marianne Huff, President and CEO of the Mental Health Association in Michigan, better known as MHAM. Tonight we are hosting the first ever virtual tribute celebration event. Like so many other nonprofits, MHAM is using technology to keep connected and to host its annual event. Thank you all for taking the time to join us for this annual celebratory event as we honor some amazing Michigan mental health advocates. Learn a little bit more about MHAM's history and hear from someone who has firsthand experience with the impact that mental illness has upon family members. We think that you will find this event in this evening to be both interesting and educational. We hope that you find it to be thought provoking as well. I would also like to thank our sponsors for tonight's event, Synovian Pharmaceuticals, Takeda Pharmaceuticals, and Hope Network. They continually support the good work that MHAM does, as do all of you. Here are a few ways you can support MHAM. If you are on Facebook, please be sure to check in to our event and use the hashtags, hashtag MyMentalHealth, M-I-M-E-N-T-A-L-H-E-A-L-T-H, and hashtag MentalHealthMatters, hashtag M-E-N-T-A-L-H-E-A-L-T-H, M-A-T-T-E-R-S on your socials. You can also donate online during tonight's program or anytime at the link on your screen, www.mha-mi.com slash members-sponsors. Please know how much we greatly appreciate your support. We are grateful for your generosity of our sponsors, our members, and our donors and funders, such as the Flynn Foundation, the Gerstacker Foundation, the Moore Foundation, and the United Way. Thank you. 2020 may go down in history as being one of the most difficult years that our country, state, and our world has ever experienced, particularly in modern history. COVID-19 has revealed the cracks in our healthcare systems. The disparities in healthcare are not unique to the pandemic and have actually existed for a long time. This time, however, the data and the statistics are coming to light because of the numbers of persons who are black, indigenous, or people of color who have died from or contracted COVID-19, and this cannot be ignored. The long-term mental health consequences of COVID-19 are unknown. The work for MHAM and other advocates has just begun as we reimagine a behavioral health care system in Michigan that is fair, equitable, and that provides effective mental health services to all citizens in our state. This is the work of the Mental Health Association in Michigan. If you joined us for our pre-show, you learned a little bit about Clifford Beers and the origination of the mental hygiene movement in the United States at the turn of the 20th century. Beers was born in New Haven, Connecticut in 1876. He was one of five children, all of whom would suffer from psychological distress, all of whom would spend time in mental institutions, including Clifford himself. He graduated from the Sheffield Scientific School at Yale. He also started the Clifford Beers Clinic in New Haven, Connecticut in 1913, the first outpatient mental health clinic in the United States. Beers became honorary president of the World Federation for Mental Health and was a leader in the field until his retirement in 1939. He died in Providence, Rhode Island on July 9th, 1943. In a moment, we're going to dive more into the experiences of Clifford Beers with this short video that is performed by RJ Cash. RJ wrote the script that is completely written in Beer's own words. RJ's an actor from Southeast Michigan 
who has performed at Planet Ant Theater in Hamtramck, Go Comedy in Ferndale, Pointless Improv in Ann Arbor, and was the recipient of a Wild Award in 2013 for his performance of Champions at Planet Ant Theater. He's also performed in shows such as Rocky Horror Picture Show at the Ringwall Theater, the Detroit Musical, and Greece at the Planet Ant Theater. And he teaches improvisational comedy to any willing student. Thank you, RJ, for sharing this video with us. And now, here's Clifford Beers in his own words. The conditions that existed in psychiatric hospitals at the turn of the 20th century can only be described as barbaric. Lacking effective treatment for mental disorders, an individual in an asylum might be subjected to any number of treatments, including bloodletting and purgatives. Children were put in straitjackets and tied to radiators. Adults were left naked and chained to the walls. The conditions inside most of the state-operated asylums or private sanatoriums were deplorable. Given that there were no civil commitment laws in most of the states, an individual could be locked up in an institution for an undetermined length of time. Funding for these institutions was left to the states, who often did not have the ability to provide treatment, let alone custodial care. The mentally ill were called lunatics, and often placed with the elderly and with those who suffered with paresis or syphilis. It was during this period of time that Clifford Beers, a man who began the mental hygiene movement in the United States, found himself inside a sanatorium because he experienced significant symptoms of depression. In his own words, Beers explains what happened to him and why he chose to become a mental health advocate. The event was the illness of an older brother who late in June 1894 was stricken with what was thought to be epilepsy. On July 4th, 1900, he died after a six years illness. The doctors finally decided that a tumor at the base of the brain had caused his malady and his death. Now, if a brother who had enjoyed perfect health all his life could be stricken with epilepsy, what was to prevent my being similarly afflicted? This was the thought that soon got possession of my mind. Doomed to what I then thought was a living death, I thought of epilepsy. I dreamed epilepsy. Until thousands of times during the six years that this disquieting idea persisted, my overwrought imagination seemed to drag me to the very verge of an attack. I remember distinctly when the break came. It happened in November 1895 during a recitation in German. That hour in the classroom was one of the most disagreeable I ever experienced. It seemed as if my nerves had snapped like so many minute bands of rubber stretched beyond their elastic limit. As was to be expected in my case, this illness seriously depleted my vitality and left me in a frightfully depressed condition. A depression which continued to grow upon me until the final crash came on June 23rd, 1900. The events of that day seemingly disastrous as then viewed, but evidently all for the best as the issue proved, forced me along paths traveled by thousands, but comprehended by few. <laughs> She had probably descended one of three flights of stairs when the mad desire to dash my brains out on the pavement below, I rushed to that window, which was directly over the flagwalk. With my fingers, I clung for a moment to the sill, then I let go. Missing the stone pavement by not more than three or four inches, I struck on comparatively soft earth. An ambulance was summoned and I was placed in it. My mind was in a delusional state. Knowing that those who attempt suicide are usually placed under arrest, I believed myself under legal restraint. I imagined that at any moment I might be taken to court to face some charge lodged against me by the local police. 
Naturally, I was suspicious of all about me and became more so each day. And not until about a month later that I refused to recognize my relatives. It was my eldest brother who looked after my care and interests during my entire illness. Finding myself still under surveillance, I soon jumped to a second conclusion, namely that this was no brother of mine at all. After remaining at home for about a month, during which time I showed no improvement mentally, though I did gain physically, I was taken to a private sanatorium. I would occasionally engage in conversation. One, a man who during his life had more than once been committed to an institution. My friend had not stopped trying to convince me that my apparent relatives were not spurious. So one day I said to him, if my relatives still live in New Haven, their addresses must be in the latest New Haven directory. A few hours after my own private detective gave me the information I so much desired, I wrote the first letter I had written in 26 months. Though I felt reasonably confident that this message would reach my brother, I was by no means certain. The person approaching me was indeed the counterpart of my brother as I remember him. The very instant I caught sight of my letter in the hands of my brother, all was changed. The thousands of false impressions recorded during the 798 days of my depression seemed at once to correct themselves. My new power to reason correctly on some subjects simply marked the transition from depression, one phase of my disorder, to elation, another phase of it. On March 12, 1903, I wrote a letter which so disturbed the governor that he immediately set about an informal investigation of some of my charges. First, I assailed the management of the private institution where I had been straitjacketed. Then followed an account of the straitjacket experience, then an account of abuses at the state hospital. I described in detail the most brutal assault that fell to my lot. In summing up, I said the attendants claimed next day that I had called them certain names. Maybe I did, though I don't believe I did at all. What of it? Should a man be nearly killed because he swears at attendants who swear like pirates? I have seen at least 15 men, many of them mental and physical wrecks, assaulted just as brutally as I was and usually without a cause. I know that men's lives have been shortened by these brutal assaults, and that is only a polite way of saying that murder has been committed here. On leaving the hospital and resuming my travels, I felt sure that any one of several magazines or newspapers would willingly have had me conduct my campaign under its nervously commercial auspices. But a flash-in-the-pan method did not appeal to me. Those noxious growths, incompetence, abuse, and injustice had not only to be cut down, but rooted out. Therefore, I clung to my determination to write a book an instrument of attack, which if it cuts and sears at all, does so as long as the need exists. In my autobiography, A Mind That Found Itself, I make a plea for mental sufferers, but the story of the work that followed in behalf of those sufferers is now to be told. Though I call this story the mental hygiene movement, it might not inappropriately be entitled the romance of work. For me, at least, this work has been a romance and not wanting in thrills and even in dramatic moments as one difficulty after another has been overcome.
Thank you, RJ, for that informative and inspirational segment about Clifford Beers. What I appreciate about your video is the emphasis that Beers placed on advocating for better mental health care and custodial treatment for individuals with mental health conditions. The Mental Health Association in Michigan would not be in existence apart from Clifford Beers. When MHAM was established in 1936, we were originally known as the Michigan Society for Mental Hygiene. One of our main objectives at MHAM is to advocate for public policy initiatives at the state level that will increase access to quality mental health supports and services for adults and children who need them. Part of our mission includes the eradication of stigma. Even though it is 2020, there remains a fair amount of stigma about what we term to be mental illness. Stigma persists even though we know a lot more about how the brain works than ever before. And despite this increased knowledge and understanding, those with conditions such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and schizoaffective disorder remain feared and frankly often misunderstood. Our main reason for gathering virtually tonight, however, is to honor two Michigan individuals who have paved the way for those with lived experience and their loved ones. Tonight, we are honoring Michigan State Representative Mary Whiteford. We are also honoring CEO of Integrated Services of Kalamazoo, Jeff Patton. Mary Whiteford, is a state representative who I consider to be a mental health champion for individuals in Michigan who struggle with behavioral health conditions. I had the privilege of knowing Mary before she was a legislator and when she served on a community mental health board. The work that Mary has done on behalf of Michiganders with mental illness over the past five years has really been incredible. Her focus is on increasing the array of services for adults and children who struggle with behavioral health conditions. She's also responsible for the creation of the first ever statewide crisis line called MICAL or MICAL. Representative Mary Whiteford was first elected to serve the 80th district in the Michigan House of Representatives in March of 2016. Representative Whiteford serves as the chair of Health and Human Services Appropriations Subcommittee for the 2019 through 2020 legislative term. She also serves as a member of the Health Policy Committee, the Appropriations Committee, and the Appropriations Subcommittee on Joint Capital Outlay. Mary earned a Bachelor of Science in Nursing from Northern Illinois University. She worked in a pediatric neurosurgery unit before working in a pediatric emergency unit. In 1997, she started an accounting business with her husband, Kevin. They now run their own financial planning firm. Welcome State Representative Mary Whiteford. Hello, everybody. I'm State Representative Mary Whiteford, and it is an honor to be invited to be a part of the Mental Health Association of Michigan's event today. So I'm a nurse, I'm a daughter, I'm a mom. Um, all of these things together taught me so much about how fragile people can be, but with the right supports, how they can be so successful. I'm the daughter of a mom. My mom, when she was a little girl, she was abused. And so she ended up having some real big mental health challenges when I was a child. And as a child, I didn't know better. But as I got older, I started to understand. And then I've got children who have had different challenges from some substance abuse to depression, anxiety. And I got to feel the angst and fear and passion of being a mom and being the only person to be there for those people, for my family, for my mom. And that's where I learned how to be an advocate in my nursing role, I saw children who had mental illness and challenges and seeing the angst and the fear and the frustration. And the point is that there is so little access to care. So when you reach out for help, you don't know better. You don't know if somebody's going to be there for you or not. So that's why I've been 
um, taking on this as a huge passion. I'm so proud and honored to leave a legacy for Michigan, uh, something I worked on from my experience in over three years here in Lansing, and that's the Michigan Crisis and Access Line. It's starting to be rolled out in the beginning of 2021. And what this means is anybody who needs help from very mild symptoms that a family sees um, where they wanna find help for their loved one to somebody who's in a terrible crisis to our psychiatric beds and where to go if somebody does need that to crisis units, which I have a bill up in the Senate right now to establish freestanding crisis stabilization units. Um, I also have a bill that was actually up today and that's to help children who don't need the intense environment of a psychiatric hospital to more of a transitional setting. Uh, so all of these things are getting rolled up as an access point to the Michigan crisis and access line. We can call, there will be a, somebody there to answer. Police officers can call, ER nurses can call, moms and sisters and dads and family members can call. So I'm working hard to make sure that that continues. I've got great partners in the Department of Health and Human Services, because as you guys know, you can't do it alone. You need to put together your team. And you guys are part of my team. I get to find out what it's like, what you guys are feeling, what families are facing um, with their children, with their moms, with their um, siblings, with their spouses. So thank you for being there for me. Thank you for advocating for the people in your lives. Thank you for letting me be part of the puzzle that helps move forward in making sure that people get the help that they need when they need it. I appreciate you and God bless you all. Thank you. Representative Whiteford for joining us tonight. We're honored to be donating tonight to your favorite charity, Great Lakes Futures and Solutions Incorporated. We also applaud and celebrate all your work on behalf of the most vulnerable citizens in Michigan. Next up, we honor Jeff Patton, CEO of Integrated Services of Kalamazoo. I have been privileged to know Jeff for over 10 years. I was able to get to know Jeff when he was the CEO of Southwest Michigan PIHP and Kalamazoo CMH was the prepaid inpatient health plan until 2014. He's always been a consummate advocate for the persons and families served by the community mental health system in Michigan. Jeff is a social worker, a graduate of Western Michigan University. Jeff has a distinguished public service career in public community and mental health. Since 2001, Mr. Patton has led Integrated Services of Kalamazoo, formerly known as Kalamazoo Community Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services. As the Chief Executive Officer, a public county-sponsored community mental health services authority for Kalamazoo County. Jeff's prior positions include Deputy Director of the Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services Administration and Director of the Bureau of Community and Hospital Services within the Michigan Department of Community Health, now known as the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. In the 1980s, he served as the Executive Director of the Family Health Center Incorporated in Kalamazoo and a resident of Kalamazoo County, Jeff serves on various boards and in volunteer positions, including as chair of the Board of Trustees at Kalamazoo Valley Community College. His professional recognitions include champion of behavioral health care, friend of mental health, national advisory council member for the Center for Mental Health Services, United States Department of Health and Human Services, Administrator of the Year, and Outstanding College Corporate Partnership Award. Thank you, Jeff, for being with us. Greetings, everyone. My name is Jeff Patton, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Integrated Services of Kalamazoo. And today I extend my sincere appreciation to the Mental Health Association in Michigan to be recognized as part of this virtual tribute celebration of 2020. Such a recognition further supports the years of work and long list of accomplishments 
of the Mental Health Association of Michigan. I humbly consider my recognition, not necessarily for the work that I do, but for our combined mission and purpose to serve people with serious mental illnesses, people with co-occurring substance use disorders, and also people with intellectual or developmental disabilities. I wanna emphasize here that recovery works. Our combined work should always recognize that people have the capability to take charge of their lives with adequate specialized mental health supports and services. I believe far too often the public mental health system attempts to improve the quality of mental health services merely by perfecting institutions rather than achieving transformational goals of recovery from a more practical approach that recognizes the realities in which people actually lead their lives. People do not and should not lead or be expected to lead, to lead their lives by the ways the mental health system is currently funded and how providers must bill for reimbursements for services. This issue must be our next challenge and priority for change in order to make meaningful progress in improving Michigan's mental health system. So thank you again for this honor and I look forward to continuing the partnership with the Mental Health Association of Michigan. Well, we hope you're enjoying our tribute celebration so far. And you know, we're really grateful and thankful for your donations that we see coming in. Again, if you would like to donate, please go to the link on your screen, www.mha-mi.com forward slash members dash sponsors. Next up, I will share with you a heartfelt interview with MHAM board member, Elizabeth Pratt. She will share her lived experience with having a child who struggles with serious mental health concerns. In this interview, Elizabeth talks about what it's been like for her and her husband as they sought to find appropriate mental health services for their adult son. Unfortunately, the community mental health system missed its opportunity to help Elizabeth's son and the next step was for her son to be engaged with the criminal justice system, which really is where so many individuals with mental health conditions land when appropriate mental health services cannot be accessed. Elizabeth's story is important because it highlights the fact that many Michiganders with the most significant forms of mental health conditions are often unable to get treatment until they find themselves in prison or in jail. Unfortunately, the new psychiatric hospitals are the jails and the prisons. Despite efforts to help individuals with mental health conditions move from institutions to the community, due to a lack of access to care and to public policy that emphasizes jail diversion, many are incarcerated. And you know, there's something inherently wrong with that picture. So to sort of add some emphasis to this issue, here are some sobering and disturbing statistics from an article that appeared in the Prison Legal News in 2019. In 2018, the Bureau of Justice Statistics reported that 14% of prisoners in state and federal facilities met the criteria for having serious mental health conditions. In local jails, the number was 26%. Only 5% of the population, the general population, meets those criteria, according to the BJS. Mental illness also affects a higher percentage of female prisoners than male prisoners. According to federal data, 40% of prisoners were diagnosed with a mental health disorder between 2011 and 2014. Every year, 2 million people with psychological problems are jailed based on estimates by the National Alliance on Mental Illness. A 2016 report by the Treatment Advocacy Center found that mentally ill prisoners stay locked up longer, cost more to house, and are more likely to commit suicide and be placed in solitary confinement. The costs of incarcerating the mentally ill are significant. In Michigan, 
where mental illness afflicts a quarter of the state's 41,000 prisoners, it costs $95,000 a year to house each one, compared to $35,000 for prisoners without mental health problems. For the mentally ill who are not incarcerated, the state spends just $6,000 each per year on average. I feel like if people haven't been directly involved with a loved one with mental illness, that they may not understand the barriers to finding care, the systemic mm -hmm. barriers, both in the private system and the public system, and the, the impact that it can have both on the family and the ill individual. I think there are so many um, difficulties that people face with mental illness, and it's, it's all too common, but yet there's been such a reluctance in the past to have many of the stories out there in the public eye. Mm -hmm. Families have in the past been reluctant to share, mm -hmm. and so it's nice to have this opportunity to, to introduce people. And the fact that, you know, families sometimes don't want to talk about what it's like to have a loved one who struggles with a psychiatric condition because, you know, for a long time, people just didn't always talk about it, did they? That's right. It, you know, for a long time, it was kind of secretive. <laughs> but now I think our understanding of mental illness has advanced so much. Mm -hmm. You know, we know that mental illnesses are medical illnesses mm -hmm. that may have environmental triggers. Mm -hmm. And we need to really take that stigma part out of it so that people can speak about their experiences and feel more free to access the help that is available. Mm -hmm. I guess in, in our case, our son's behavior really started to change when he was around 23. Okay. And he started having um, different kind of thoughts, different personalities, much more angry and revved up. There was um, some paranoia and suspicion. And it became very hard for us to know what we were seeing with him and what would help. We tried to um, connect him with a therapist, but that was not the real answer at that point. Mm -hmm. And so without effective help, um, his situation went the way many um, families have faced where an individual with mental illness ends up becoming to the attention of law enforcement and come into the criminal justice system. In part, that's because there was the lack of appropriate care up front. Mm -hmm. And then criminal justice system is what's left. It's a very sad system, very hard on all involved. What you're saying is that when, when a person who's struggling psychiatrically can't get appropriate care for whatever reason, then at some point they encounter law enforcement and then they end up getting what mental health treatment through the criminal justice system or how does that work? Well, in our case, you know, we'd been struggling at home, wondering what to do. And mm -hmm. we, my husband and I started to feel threatened and we considered that whether or not we should get an involuntary order for treatment and evaluation through the probate court. I see. But we were not sure how to how that would go or how that would affect our long term relationship with our son. Mm -hmm. But before we did that, there was an emergency at the house and we called the police. And as a result of that, um, he ended up um, convicted of an attempted assault on an officer, which resulted mm -hmm. in a first jail term. But after shortly after that, we did um, file the while he was still in jail, we did file the probate court petition and he was evaluated and found to be a person in need of treatment and had his first um, hospital stay at that time okay. down at the Kalamazoo Hospital, State mm -hmm. Hospital. And that was helpful. But yet, um, because he'd been in jail and was still incarcerated, the treatment plan upon discharge of the hospital was simply to return him to jail. Oh. And then when he got out of jail, the treatment plan was just to discharge him with a maybe a week's worth of medication. And then he's back to our home. And at that time, even though he was under a probate court treatment order, the community mental health system wouldn't accept him for treatment because they didn't feel his treatment was, uh, or his condition was severe and persistent enough to merit their attention at that point. Even though the probate court order said that the treatment was to be provided by community mental health. 
and our private, the private physician, the psychiatrist that Gary had seen for some, you know, anxiety and depression type conditions as a young person refused to see him on the grounds that he was now too ill for that practice mm -hmm. and that they did not have the resources in the private practice to assure the kind of treatment adherence that mm -hmm. because of the, um, that there would be a better variety and available in the public system. And yet the public system wouldn't take him. It's a terrible position to be in. On the one hand, the community mental health system, which is supposed to be for those individuals with the most severe conditions, said no. And yet those who serve individuals with the mild to moderate conditions said no. In many practices at that time, just had a blanket policy. They didn't accept people on mental health treatment orders. Um, but, you know, he did find someone, but he didn't have a relationship with them like he had with this person who'd worked with him through his youth. I see. So that was, and then he was back in jail. So it was a very difficult situation. I think that the public mental health system has tools available that the private mental health system doesn't offer and aren't covered by private insurance. Mm -hmm. Things like um, case management, peer support counseling, um, crisis stabilization, and various kinds of outreach programs that can bring mental health care to someone in their home if they do not understand their need for treatment. Mm -hmm. I think the private situation is system is really set up right now for people who have insight into their conditions mm -hmm. and understand um, what they need and have the ability to make an appointment, to keep it, to pick up their medication, to take it according to the schedule. These are all very complicated skills. <laughs> and when a person is in the grip of psychosis, if they're not able to think clearly, if they're delusional and are having a hard time understanding who's on their side and who mm -hmm. isn't, to have them be responsible for taking all this initiative mm -hmm. into getting the help they need is really unrealistic. Mm -hmm. The family's ability to step up is limited in the case of an adult because mm -hmm. the family member cannot order treatment mm -hmm. or require it. We do have some better laws now um, regarding assisted outpatient treatment, which is mm -hmm. something that families can access, which is an, an involuntary outpatient treatment. But that, um, again, it's an underfunded mm -hmm. program. And so it's hard for people to get that kind of um, support that works mm -hmm. when it's not necessarily covered by their insurance policy. Had your son gotten treatment, do you think he would have ended up in jail the first time? Well, you know, it's hard to know. Mm -hmm. I certainly wish as a family that we had tried the involuntary treatment order earlier. Mm -hmm. We were afraid that, you know, it was something that maybe he would never forgive us or something. Mm -hmm. But that proved not to be the case. And I wish mm -hmm. that was something we had been more confident about accessing. That's really heartbreaking to see your child become ill like that mm -hmm. and not know what to do or how to help. Um, it had a big impact on our family. There was conflict over you know, what to do, what was the most appropriate thing to do. Could we manage in our home with him together or or not. Mm -hmm. These are all things that were very difficult. Um, it's, I think the, the stress of all that, I, I myself then um, sought treatment for help with um, depression and anxiety and basically a lot of issues from earlier in my life that came back on me full force under this stress mm -hmm. and I've had a lot of help with that. Yes, I think, I think the shock of his first arrest mm -hmm. was just very difficult to deal with, mm -hmm. knowing that you know he'd been arrested in our home, that they'd attempted to tase him, that there'd been this this um, conflict with the officer. It was very distressing. I'm wondering too, the first time that you did call the police, were you envisioning that the police would take him to the hospital to be evaluated? Yes, I mean, that mm -hmm. was our hope, was that someone would come and defuse the situation and and that then, you know, he would have access to care. Mm -hmm. There are now, in some cases, there are opportunities for individuals to go through mental health court. Mm -hmm. This wasn't available in our county at that time. And even that now is, is limited. And it's, on the one hand, I think it's wonderful that problem-solving courts can help people, guide people into treatment. 
but it's also very frustrating to me that it wait you wait until after there's been some very concerning incident which you know there's perhaps you know potential crime or some kind of big problem and right. then the help comes through the criminal justice system while the the mental health system both the public and the private system have not been able to adequately step up you know which is so distressing when now we know that there are things that can be done. There are ways to, you know, reach out, help motivate people into care mm -hmm. and to provide services that will really help. Sure. Well, the thing that that really concerns me the most is this huge overrepresentation of people with severe mental illness in prison and jail. Mm -hmm. I think that's just a tragedy. I mean, we know that there's a lot of problems with our criminal justice system you know, in terms of the mass incarceration, particularly of people from minority groups, people of mm -hmm. color, and the mental ill, people with mental illness are also one of the groups that is vastly overrepresented in the, in the incarceration. I think the idea that someone could get an illness like that, and yet the treatment doors are inaccessible to them, and they end up in this punitive environment, mm -hmm. which is not set up to be therapeutic. I just, it's just really um, tragic, I feel. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you, Elizabeth, for having the courage to share your story with us. You know, it's not easy to talk about a topic as sensitive as mental illness in somebody that we love. Unfortunately, even though it's 2020, Talking about mental health is still somewhat of a taboo topic. Stigma that surrounds behavioral health conditions continues to negatively impact individuals who need treatment in a variety of ways and actually is a barrier to treatment. There's certainly a need to advocate for better alternatives to treatment for individuals that is not about sending them to jail, sending them to prison, or homelessness. It's really an important conversation for us to be having, particularly as we look at the impact that the pandemic has had upon the collective mental health of all Michiganders. Also, the impact it's had on those with mental health conditions that are in the jails and in the prisons. I really want to thank everybody for joining us this evening. And um, on behalf of the MHAM Board of Directors and staff, We'd really like to thank tonight's sponsors again, because, you know, without the sponsors and you, this really wouldn't be possible. So thank you to Synovian Pharmaceuticals. Thank you to Takeda Pharmaceuticals. And thank you to Hope Network. Congratulations again to our honorees, Michigan State Representative Mary Whiteford. Thank you, Mary. And CEO of Integrated Services of Kalamazoo, Jeff Patton. Thank you, Jeff. Both of you are incredibly deserving of this award, and we look forward to continuing our work with you. You know, we hope you will continue the conversation about our event and about mental health. Make sure that you include this information on all your socials and include the hashtags, hashtag M-I-M-E-N-T-A-L-H-E-A-L-T-H, hashtag my mental health, and hashtag Mental Health Matters or hashtag M-E-N-T-A-L-H-E-A-L-T-H-M-A-T-T-E-R-S. Thank you. And you can still donate online or anytime at the link on your screen, www.mha-mi.com forward slash members dash sponsors. We also really want to thank you for your donations. Thank you for your membership. We're going to end our event now with Michigan musician and singer-songwriter Taylor Taylor as she brings us one of her original songs, All Right. A line from her song is, it's all right, whatever you're feeling at this time. And you know, this is so true, especially right now. All of us, we're all dealing with many different things right now many experiences, personal, political, environmental. 
we want you to remember that it's okay to feel what you're feeling. And we hope you call on us if you need mental health resources. Because you know what? We're here to advocate for you and your family and those you love and care for. Thank you again for joining us this evening. And a big thank you to the following who made this event possible. First and foremost, the MHAM Board of Directors. Andy Cash for editing the Clifford Beers video and for teaching me about video editing. RJ Cash for hosting the event. Kristen Taylor for her tireless efforts at arranging the event, writing scripts, and just doing whatever needs to be done. Steve Ann Every for helping with donations and letter writing. Elizabeth Pratt for sharing her story. And we really want to thank Uno Deuce for putting it all together for us. I also want to thank Matt Hudkins for writing the checks. And a big thanks to Deb Drick and Demita Wallace. Again, I want to thank Synovian Pharmaceuticals and Takeda Pharmaceuticals for supporting this program. And also, I want to thank Hope Network for its support and for its work that it does with our people. And, you know, again, a final thank you to Representative Mary Whiteford and to Jeff Patton and to all of you for taking the time out of your busy day to join us this evening. We really, really appreciate it. Here's a few final thoughts for everybody. Take care of yourselves. That's really, really important that you do that. It's also important for you to take care of each other. And you can't take care of each other if you don't take care of yourself first. And also, stay tuned. Thank you again. Again, thank you everyone for joining us for the 2020 MHAM Tribute Celebration. We appreciate your sponsorships, your membership, your donations, and the time you give to MHAM. crying for well, think about it just think about it to call up a friend or keep to yourself well how long until you ask for help for how long can time repeat itself It's alright Whatever you're feeling at this time If you're numb and don't feel nothing, it's alright Whatever you're feeling at this time, it's alright It's alright Now you think too much You're putting yourself under attack Well come on, take a step back You've been here before You seem to have lost track Well you know that none of this will last And you know that it all can change so fast It's alright, whatever you're feeling at this time If you're numb and don't feel nothing, it's alright Whatever you're feeling at this time, it's alright And there's no need to worry, no need to worry You've got time And there's no need to worry, no need to worry No It's alright Whatever you're feeling at this time
time If you're numb and don't feel nothing, it's alright Whatever you're feeling at this time, it's alright It's alright